Hey guys. So today's episode is another release of another podcast. This is one that I was interviewed on. This is with my friend, Rachel Gregory, who is a board certified nutrition specialist. She's a strength and conditioning specialist. She's an author and podcaster. Um, she has her master's degree in nutrition and exercise physiology from James Madison university. Um, and she is actually the, did the first ever human clinical trial looking at the effects of the ketogenic diet in non elite CrossFit athletes. Um, and that's published in the international journal of sports and exercise medicine. Um, Rachel interviewed me on this and I love it so much because we both kind of taken similar role roads in the ketogenic community. Um, we both have learned that what we really value, especially for women is this concept of metabolic flexibility of yes, being able to do keto, being able to use keto as a tool, but then to bring healthy carbohydrates back in and not be afraid of them so much. So I asked Rachel if she could please let me share this this episode from her podcast, which is called Metflix and chill. So she's talking all about metabolism. Um, and I thought I would share, share it because it's like less boring than you guys just listening to me rant on and on by myself about my thoughts about metabolic flexibility. And, um, you can hear a little bit of my story as well. And my own fitness journey, my own path, what happened when I went keto, what happened when I brought cars back in, how I developed this whole, um, philosophy around keto in and out and like why I think doing keto is really awesome for people, but definitely not forever for like most people. So we're going to dive into that. Um, I really appreciate her uh, allowing me to share this with you guys on my podcast. I will link her podcast, um, and her website and her Instagram and the notes so that you can find Rachel as well. She's freaking awesome. Make sure you follow her, um, and subscribe to her podcast as well. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and get into it. Here is me and Rachel Gregory on her Netflix and chill podcast, talking keto metabolism and all things metabolic flexibility. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients, and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults, and their nanoparticle size minerals. So um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away. And I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test, there's no way to know. And you you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So, um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So, um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios, right? So, um, yeah, take advantage of it, guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting, and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount on to you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Hey guys, before we get into the episode, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about higher coaching. This is my coaching system. And I get a lot of questions because, um, it's not just training and nutrition. We do that. I love training and nutrition, obviously, but we also do more. We do personal development and the way that's delivered is a 90 day personal development program that you go through with me when you work with me. So it's a video course with questions for you to deep dive in yourself for the first 90 days of working with me. Now that comes as part of a morning routine. I am really big on the morning routine and you ask any of my clients, I will push you on that because it's life changing. So we start with meditation and then we do gratitude and then that personal development program. Um, that's our deep dive psychologically. And after the 90 days, you go to the next level, you start doing what I'm doing currently. And it's a lot of strategic goal setting and it's really, really honestly, 
miraculous what's happening, not only in my life, but in my clients' lives. Like it brings me to tears when I get on calls with them. I'm like, do you see yourself? Like, do you see what you're doing? That is so cool. So anyway, that is um, for me, the bread and butter of my coaching. I love it so much. Um, also though, in, in regards to your body, I also like to go deep dive and see what might be holding you back. So that's where all the biohacking side comes in. We do a physiological deep dive as well. So we do blood testing, hair mineral testing, DNA testing, body composition, aura ring. Um, so your heart rate variability, your sleep cycles. Do you have any deficiencies? Do you have issues with sleep you didn't even know about? Let's find out, you know? Um, so that's, that's how I approach things in higher. There's more, we do prizes every month, Nikes, Lulu's, um, all of my favorite products and foods to keep you motivated, to keep those habits up. We do three Zoom calls a week so you get support. We have a private Facebook group. We're all vibing and, and cheering each other along the way. We get raw and real and honest. And it's just, yeah, it's like I created my life and I created my life the way I like. And I like to deep dive with a bunch of bad A people that really want to optimize their lives. And it's an honor for me to serve them in that. Um, so I just thought I would tell you about it because I don't know if I talk about it quite enough. So if you're looking for that, if you're like wanting the next level in your body and also in your life, truly, that's what we're doing. So uh, seeking bad A's <laughs> to join higher. I do have some spots open. Um, it is limited. I can only handle so many clients at a time, but if you would like to find out if it's a good fit for you, you can go to my website, taragarrison.com, and you can request a call and we can see if, if it's a great fit for you. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to tell you guys about higher so you could get a little glimpse into what I'm doing on the daily. And if you're looking for something a little more self-guided, I do have my keto in and out program, um, on my website. So you can either do a small taste and try it for eight weeks, or you can go a full year. That baby is comprehensive. There is a video of every recipe, video of every exercise. There's a 60 day course teaching you how to do keto or 30 days of keto. And then 30 days of bringing back the carbs, FAQ video library, Facebook group, like all of that. So if you're more of like the self-guided person and you just want stuff planned for you, um, that is also an option on my website. It's taragarrison.com. I'll link it all in the show notes and all right, we'll go ahead and get into our episode. All right. Welcome back to Matt Flex and Chill. This is Rachel Gregory, your host, and I'm here with Tara Garrison. What's up, Tara? How are you? Hey, I'm good, Rachel. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat with you today. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. Um, mm -hmm. I've been so excited to have you on as we were talking off air. Like we have so many similarities and <laughs> I feel like we've been through a lot of the same paths with, you know, working with clients. And so I'm excited yep. to kind of dive into all of those, all of those things. So before we get started, do you want to just tell our listeners or viewers um, a little bit about your background, just give us your story, um, sure. you know, how you got to where you are today. Sure. Yeah. I like to share my story because I think it's so relatable for so, so many women and like just on a very, and guys too, but like on a very real level, I'm just like, guys, I figured it out. I figured it out. It was hard for me my whole life and I figured it out. And I can't wait to share that with you guys. And what I mean by that is like, very, I have like the very classic story of um, growing up in like the 80s and 90s where everybody lived off of like basically survival food, like bunker food is kind of how I like to look at it. It's like post Cold War, like Wonder Bread, you know, like everything had to be shelf stable. So it was very much that life, like, yeah, kind of mixed in with some healthy food, but mostly like, I remember Chef Boyardee mm -hmm. ravioli and like, like, you know, uh, pop tarts and, uh, processed white breads and, you know, peanut butter and jelly and all that stuff. Like we all lived that life. Um, and for me, I started getting chubby in about third grade. I also had unresolved childhood trauma and I'm open about that too, because that's a huge part of the work I do is mindset work now. And man, those unresolved traumas, like if you turned to food as a coping mechanism for some of that stuff, like you got to take a look at that, you know? So I had, um, some neglect. I had a mom who had mental illness. Um, I was sexually molested for a large portion of my childhood. Um, and, uh, we were very poor just even like feelings of not enoughness, not being adequate, you know, not measuring up, like all of that stuff was really unaddressed for a long time. Um, and, and I share that cause that, like, 
there's no shame in it. You know, we all have stuff. We all have challenges. That's part of the earth experience. So like if you can get open about it and find out and stop shaming yourself and start seeing that you just need to understand what happened inside of you as a result of those things, what stories you started to tell, um, what habits, um, what coping mechanisms you developed as a result of those things. And you can actually look at them and you can say, Oh, okay. I don't, I can see now in this more healed place that I'm in that I don't need to do that anymore. And you can start to problem solve. So anyway, um, started getting chubby third grade, kind of figured it out sort of, um, in high school, but like weight was always an issue for me. Um, I have four kids. So like after every pregnancy, like trying to lose weight, was just always just this, this brutal thing, especially after my fourth. And that's when it got really hard. I turned 30, like a week after I had my fourth baby. And I don't know if it was just getting older or what, but I couldn't lose the weight. And this is where it gets even more like, I see so many women doing this. Like, it's like quintessential. It's like, okay, I'm going to run. Right. So I'm going to, I need to lose weight. So I'm going to run. Mm-hmm. And, um, I'm also going to go to workout classes. So anything from orange theory to whatever they had at my gym, to Zumba, to the little weightlifting workout class, all of it. And, um, man, I, no problems working out. I was, I was running full marathons, you know, 26 mile marathons and doing all these work, working out very consistently, um, not losing any weight at all. So I was about like, I'm five, six, I was like 175 pounds, not not with muscle mass though. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's about where I was at after my fourth. And I was, I was just so frustrated. I was just like it, the feelings that I see in my clients now, I can relate to them. So I'm glad I went through it because you know, I know that feeling of being like, just freaking forget it. Like I just keep trying and I'm spinning my wheels and I just wish some trainer could move in with me and like <laughs> knock the brownie out of my hands. And like, I don't know, like, I guess I've just other people can figure this out. I'm always just going to be moderately overweight my whole life. Like I'm never going to be able to change this. And really where that changed for me was weightlifting, lifting weights. Um, and, and it really was interesting how it happened. Now there's a two, two reasons. One, I got really tired of like having my whole day eaten up by driving to the gym at nine 30 in the morning for the 10 AM Zumba class, dropping my kids off in the daycare. Then by the time I get home, it's lunchtime. Like it's like my whole first part of my day was like eaten up by this whole like daycare gym workout class thing. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, it's like me working out is taking up like half of my day with my kids. So what I did was I, I, I quit that gym and I joined this little cheap $10 a month, like nothing, you know, just this very basic little gym that was practically in my neighborhood. It was so close, but all they had was cardio equipment and weights. They didn't have workout classes. They didn't have daycare. They didn't have any of that. So, um, I started going when I put my kids to bed at night. So like I put my kids in eight 30, I would go. So not really optimal from a circadian rhythm standpoint, but it was what worked for me at that time in my life. Cause my husband at the time I was married, um, he had to leave for really early for work, like way mm-hmm. earlier than I was going to get up being up at night with babies and stuff. So that's what worked for me. And out of pure resourcefulness, like there was no other option. I was like, well, if I'm going to do anything besides run, I guess I'm gonna have to learn how to lift weights. So I asked a friend who was a trainer, um, she had really nice arms and I was like, how do you do that? Like, what do I do? Where do I even start? And she just sat there and showed me exercises were sitting in my backyard. And she's like, you you know, you put your arms out to the side like this and you put them out to the front, like do like 10 to each of those. And I wrote on notebook paper, like arms out to sides, arms out to front 10 times. (laughs) And I like, I didn't even know what they were called. I didn't know it was called a lateral raise and a front raise, you know, Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And I just brought that little piece of notebook paper with me to the gym for three months. That is the only weightlifting workout that I did because I was so intimidated. I didn't know what to do. I was just, I felt safe with that. And then once I got safe with that and I got, I was like, okay, I've kind of, this is the only thing I'm doing. I started to research a little more and I'm just this I'm sharing. Cause it's like, it's so simple, really. Um, like I'm just looking up like leg exercises <laughs> and I'm finding videos and I'm like, you know, bodybuilding.com like best leg workout. I'm like, okay, I'll do that one. You know? And I think a lot of people have been through that process, but it was, it was, um, as I started to dive deeper into it, I started to, um, get that hobby kind of vibe. Oh, what else can I do? What else can I learn? Um, and also one other thing I like to share is 
it was very intimidating and uncomfortable for me at first. And a lot of people, we call it gym intimidation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it can be an intimidating environment. It's like a new culture, especially when you are overweight, you don't have all the gym, cool gym clothes that apparently everyone has. You're like, what is this world I'm in? Um, you're, you don't know what you're doing. You feel like everyone is watching you. They're not, I promise. <laughs> Um, and yeah, your ego doesn't like it. It doesn't feel good. And I had to get over that. I was like, I, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm this overweight mom <laughs> who has no idea what she's doing, but all of these people started somewhere too. And I just kept that in mind. I was like, everybody starts somewhere. Everybody starts somewhere. Um, the other part I like to share of my story is that I had a really unhealthy motivation that drove me really hard in the beginning. And that was that I was having marriage problems and because of those marriage problems, I felt like my body wasn't enough and that if I got my body better, that it would help and it would heal all these marriage issues that we're having. So it really like, you know, we can look at it as sad, but I actually, I honor that part of my journey because I think sometimes we can be brought to emotional lows and have kind of unhealthy motivation, but, but for a purpose that can actually lead us into our purpose. And so, because what happened is, yeah, that drove me like crazy, right? That feeling of not enoughness drove me like crazy. So not a super healthy motivation, but it definitely can drive action when it's really deep, when insecurities and pain and, and fear are really deep, they can drive action. Um, but what happened is while I was in this unhealthy mindset, I also simultaneously started developing this healthy mindset where I was like, wow, this is really cool what my body can do. And I started learning about the body and I started becoming fascinated by my body and I started feeling more empowered. I'm like, wow, like through my own discipline and hard choices, I can do this. And I started to also get empowered. And then as I started to build and honor and earn and, and get respect for the body, I started to heal my relationship with it too. I was like, man, you're more than enough. Like you do so many cool things, body. Like, wow. Like I really respect and honor you. And I also along with a lot of healing work that I did with, you know, uh, plant medicines, uh, coaches, guides, <laughs> my mindset mentors, doing my own mindset work and seeing my own shadows and a lot of healing work. I, sh I shifted, but I had built these incredible habits from this place of unworthiness and unhealthiness. So I share that because I hear that a lot and people who are highly successful, you know, like maybe it's an entrepreneur who's really successful. Sometimes they started with a really unhealthy from an unhealthy place. Like their dad told them they would never amount to anything and they had to prove that they would, <laughs> but then later they healed it. And, but that, that maybe that part of their journey was there for a purpose to get them into their purpose. And so for me now I am living my purpose. Like I remember run one day I was bounding up the stairs in my house. I was just running. I was skipping. I was skipping. Like I was doing every third step. I was like, and I was like cleaning or something. And I remember thinking, Oh my gosh, like I have so much more energy now. Like I literally just feel stronger in my body. I want women to know what this feels like. This feels freaking good. And so that's what, pushed me into training and nutrition. And now that's what I'm doing on the daily is helping women feel strong in their bodies and empowered in their mindsets and loving their bodies and healing from all that old crap. So, um, I'm grateful for my journey and all the, all the crap and all the hard <laughs> stuff. And, and I share that. Cause like, if you're in that place, like, just think about it. Like who's to say that exactly all the pains that you're going through ha aren't preparing you for something greater. And if you can use it to help other people, then you honor it you honor what happened because I could very easily be working at a dentist office right now mm -hmm. and not be using any of this. But so think about that. Like, how can you use the pain? How can you use the things that you've learned and wisdom and bring that to other people, even if it's just on a friendship level, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So yeah, that's yeah, basically my journey in a nutshell. <laughs> No, I love it. I love it. And I feel like, like you said, so many people can relate to obviously not, you know, exact, but there's just so many, so many different ways that people can relate. I'm just listening to your story. There's little things that you said that I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've felt, you know, that type of thing in a, maybe not the exact way, but so yeah, I love, I love your story. I think it's super, super inspirational. And, um, I think, one of the biggest things that for me was a shift, you know, in this kind of community as well, like over this last six years, I know you've been here for a long time. You've been in the community kind of the same, the same amount that I have, I've been. And I think one of the things that we relate on a, on a, you know, understanding is just like kind of going through these extremes of like, okay, keto is great and it worked. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, yeah. it's great. I'm going to just do this for the rest of my life. But then you come to a point, mm -hmm. you're like, wait, 
this isn't working anymore, but I still have this like ingrained in my head that I need to keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of with your experience, do you want to just chat a little bit about like, Mm -hmm. you know, the nutrition side of things? Like, how did you get into keto? Like, how did that Mm -hmm. get into your life? And like, what was your experience with that? Yeah, I love talking about this. Thank you for bringing it up. And you're exactly right. Like, I love talking to you because we're like, yeah, (laughs) we've been on such a similar path. Um, so my keto journey is really interesting because when I, I did not, I did not lose my weight doing keto. I had never even heard of keto when I, when I lost weight. So I went from, to give some perspective, I went from like 175 pounds to 135 pounds, but extremely muscular. So my body composition, that was in about a year and a half. My body composition got radically different. I look like a completely different person. And so, um, I did that through low carb ish to me. It felt low carb. Um, it was probably, I don't even know, probably around like a hundred to anywhere between a hundred and 200 grams of carbs a day, which is interesting because we consider that low carb because of standard American diet, but (laughs) it's probably not really that low carb, but just really, I switched to honestly, kind of like a, a bodybuilder diet approach of just, um, whole foods, lots of lean proteins, adding some healthy fats, but mostly I was trying to really fill up on vegetables and lean proteins and then adding, you know, sweet potato, uh, guacamole, coconut oils, you know, things like that, but just shifting into, um, prioritizing protein and actually eating real food dramatically changed my body. So, um, it did it. I definitely felt like a low carb approach. I remember at one point I was saying like vegetables are carbs, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, like vegetables were my carbs a lot, right? Which is going to have be pretty low carb on your net carbs. Mm-hmm. Um, then after that, I, so I got down to Rachel, I got down to 11% body fat. I didn't even know I was that lean for some reason on me, like super lean doesn't look as lean. I, I think on other people. So I, I just didn't know. I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm like crazy lean. And at the time I actually was dating, I had gotten divorced and I was dating a guy who was like a keto expert. So he was like a leader in the keto community. And so he really wanted me to try keto, of course. And I was super skeptical. I was like, mm, I don't know. I feel like I got a good thing going. Like I'm not even tracking my food and I'm pretty lean and strong and active. And like, I don't really want to mess it up, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't even really like fat, fatty foods. I don't even <laughs> like bacon. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So I was resistant to it for a little while, but as I was reading about it and researching and I just, I I love the, the brain health aspect of it and the scientific aspect of like building more mitochondria and reducing inflammation and increasing brain power and longevity, all the longevity stuff that was coming out. I'm like, ah, Mm. I like how like mm, cutting edge and, and healthy, the, the, the health aspects, the health benefits I'm seeing from this. I was like, okay, I'm going to try it. So I, so I, I did it and immediately for me, one of the the things that I love most about keto is how I feel mentally and emotionally. I feel freaking good. Cause mm-hmm. I think that also my fats were pretty low before I started keto. So when people switch into ketosis, they, gen- if their fats have been low, like they're going to get a pretty good, like hormone balancing effect. And they're going to feel the, feel the difference of that. Mm-hmm. And I definitely did. Um, Also, because I had just found out I was 11% body fat, I felt like that was a little low for a woman. And so I intentionally wanted to get my body fat up. So Mm -hmm. I was drastically changing my nutrition and I was really going ham with all of the fats. Um, So these are early keto days. I mean, this was like, this is like you, if you researched keto on Google, you would just get a bunch of articles telling you how you, you would get keto acidosis and die. Yeah. That was basically the information that was available online at that point. And so, um, I was kind of doing some things wrong, I guess, <laughs> you know, I was like making tons of like Alfredo sauces and like decadent chocolate keto sauce desserts and like cream cheese, jalapeno poppers wrapped in bacon, like tons of them dipped in ranch, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, the calorie excess was unreal. And so I did gain body fat. So if anybody's wondering, you can definitely gain body fat on keto. I gained, um, these, this is DEXA scanned. Okay. So it's pretty, pretty accurate. In four months, in the first four months of keto, I gained 10 pounds of body fat. Wow. Right? So um, mm-hmm. I gained a pound of muscle and 10 pounds of body fat. So I was like, okay, probably good. Probably good. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can probably slow that down yeah. now. <laughs> um, but what was interesting is I couldn't. I couldn't, um, I didn't continue to gain body fat, but I, I also wanted to like drift back down to maybe like 14, 15% body fat. And I just couldn't get there. 
I was like, mm, I was really struggling in that way. And so some of the struggles that I experienced on keto from a body composition standpoint was yes, I could go a really long time without eating. Right. And uh, most of people experience that on, on keto, which is really cool because you don't get hangry. You don't feel as dependent on food. Right. So that was cool to never have energy lulls and be able to go a really long time as an entrepreneur and just feeling like I have energy all the time. The problem was once I what I affectionately refer to as open the floodgates. And I mean, eating once I started to eat, I never want to stop. I never felt full. I did not feel satiated at the end of my meals. And I, I think personally, I think a little bit of an insulin, a little higher insulin response, which can decrease ghrelin. I think for me, I'm sensitive to that. Cause I've noticed if, even if I can just have like strawberries or something like, um, like a decent amount of them, some, something to get an insulin response, I feel great. Mm -hmm. But without that, for some reason, I just felt like it was like this gnawing, annoying feeling of like, I'm not done eating yet, um, at the end of my meals. And I think that caused me to overeat quite often on keto. So that was like my one like downside to it. And also my exercise performance, like wasn't quite at the jet fuel level that I was used to with mm -hmm. carbs. So I think those two things, you know, were like kind of the drawback key parts of keto for me, but man, like the way my brain feels, <laughs> the way I feel mental, emotional on keto, like once I let go of my current, like right now, it's really important to me to be a bad A in the gym. Like I, I, I want, I love it. I, it's like recess for me. Like I, it's important to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I think once I let that, all the body composition stuff, you know, go as a major priority in my life, I will probably be in ketosis like almost all the time as I get older because I have predispositions for Alzheimer's. My mom has Alzheimer's. I have the, the genetic mm -hmm. mutations for that. And I think that, you know, brain energy and, and brain health is going to be a priority for me as I age. Um, but yeah, like, so my story, what happened was I, um, I started doing like genetic testing, gut testing, a lot of biohacking, a lot of testing that all kept pointing towards you need carbs, you need carbs, you, your body particularly thrives on carbohydrates. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to like go back into that. And so I returned back to kind of like the way I had been eating before. So it was kind of low carbish whole foods, but having sweet potatoes, having strawberries, having regular potatoes, having fruit, banana and my protein shake again, like that whole vibe oatmeal even sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I, I immediately without tracking, I immediately dropped from that 18% body fat back down to like, I got, I was like 12 the next time I checked. So I was like, wow, that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and my exercise performance went back up. Um, so I was like, okay, so that, that was my own experience. And then, um, I was actually at keto con in 20, 18. Mm -hmm. And I had this like moment where I was like, Hmm, it, it just felt like the, it felt like the universe was like intervening with me a little bit. <laughs> and I was, you know, I'm friends with a lot of the keto influencers, keto leaders, keto industry leaders like you. And, and, and I knew like that most of my keto influencer friends were keto were, were keto, but sometimes they would supplement in carbohydrates, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we would go out to dinner and they would have sweet potato fries, or sometimes they would have like some potato or some sort of refeed refill on carbohydrates. But I didn't feel like that message was being like shared in mm -hmm. the keto community. I feel like it, I felt like it was like keto is the optimal way for all humans. Like it was like, at that time, targeted ketogenic diet and cyclical ketogenic diet were like kind of mentioned, but not really. Like mm. it was like, we were trying so hard to just get the message across about the benefits of keto that we weren't really ready to start talking about flexibility or anything else. And so I had these, um, three separate women came up to me at that conference and they were like, um, uh, it, it was just weird. It was like the same woman. It was like the same story. And they were all perimenopausal and they were all kind of overweight and they had all had success with keto. They had all lost like, you know, something like 50 to hundred pounds somewhere in there um, and loved it and loved the diet and all of that. But they were like, can you help me? They knew I was a coach. They're like, cause like, I just like, I can't get the rest of this weight off. Like no matter what I do, like I've tried more fat, less fat, more calories, less calories, like strength training, CrossFit, just walking, no exercise. Like, you know, yeah. like, I've tried like everything. I'm like, I cannot get the rest of this weight off. Like I've, I've gone to hormone clinic. They were all like going and I, I'm like hearing them and I'm like, God, they're checking off every single thing that I would check off, you know? And it, with each of them, when I got to the point where I was like, have you tried like cycling some carbohydrates back in? 
they just looked at me like deer in headlights. <laughs> like they were like, they, like, it was like jaw dropped. Like, what did you just say? It was like blasphemy mm-hmm. <laughs> at that time in the keto world. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Like sometimes, you know what I mean? Refill so you can like get more muscle building and sports performance. And, and they were like, Hmm, they're like, no. And so that's when I decided to start talking about that. And I remember I posted a purple sweet potato on my Instagram and I was so scared because I was like, I'm going to get like rejected from the keto community. They're going to be like, Oh, she's not keto anymore. Like, um, and wow, how far we've come now in 2021, like uh, this is talked about so much more, but it was like, it was scary back then. it. And, and I share this now and I, you know, my whole message is do keto, not forever. And I do my keto in and out program. And I teach people how to cycle in between. Cause I, and I know you have similar thoughts, but I just think it's so beautiful to be able to use the full range of our metabolism and not to like pendulum swing to the point where now it's, we can only be in ketosis. Mm -hmm. Like, what if we, what if we can do both? What if we can have carbs and thrive in that environment? And we can also easily switch to ketosis and thrive in that environment. To me, that's uh, using our full potential. So I love that. So that's, that's kind of just been my journey with, you know, keto and carbs and seeing that there's beauty and incredible benefits to both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're preaching to the choir. Um, yeah, (laughs) like that's obviously what, why I actually started this podcast, which has been, it's been a year, which is crazy to me that, you know, this podcast come out about metabolic flexibility. And that's really like everything you said is pretty much exactly kind of how I, how I gone through, how I went through it as well. And like, I went through my own transformation and, you know, keto is working. And then I was like, wait, it's not working anymore. Like I'm not getting full. I'm having this weird hunger. I'm fasting all the time. Like everything you said was literally exact same things that that I was Mm -hmm. feeling. Um, and at the time I was also doing CrossFit. So I like, wasn't optimizing what I could be. And yeah. then I hired my own coach and I was like, all right, I need to like get out of my head and like have yeah. someone else look in and just be like, okay, just do this and just trust somebody else to kind of take yep. over what was like, you know, bogging me down. Totally. And that completely changed. Like I lost 20 pounds. Like I prepped for a photo shoot, which came after. I the saw initial- that. Yeah. And it was just mm-hmm. like, and I used carbs strategically. And through that, you know, two years ago now or two and a half years ago, I just like learned so much about myself. And then I started to work more and more with women just like you did. Mm -hmm. And it's just like everything they were saying is like, I went through that. Like, I understand where you're coming from, like carb phobia, just like fear of, you know, eating breakfast, right? Like all of these things, it just like gets ingrained in your head. And it's Mm -hmm. like once, like you said, once you've gone through it yourself and you kind of have like gone taken other people through it and you see like how much it changes them. You're like, I just want to like shout this from the rooftops. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and don't you feel like, like I went through, I still go through this. Sometimes I went through a phase of being like, screw keto. Like I'm not even going to support it anymore. Cause I'm so tired of seeing women come mm-hmm. to me and they've got all these like restrictive mentalities with food. They basically have like eating disorders because of it. Cause they're like, they think carbs are bad and they shame themselves if they, and if they eat like a freaking like sweet potato <laughs> fries, then they go have like cake and Oreos and, and you know, chocolate mm-hmm. all night long. And then they hate them. So I like, I've had moments where I'm like, screw it, you know, and I get like so mad, but then I'm like, no, No, let me think about all my clients who have had light their entire lives. Like I feel like lives saved from Mm -hmm. doing keto. Cause if you take somebody with high inflammation and blood sugar dysregulation, and it's like, this is the only thing that's ever worked for me. And you know, PCOS, not to mention the healing I've seen in that. And like, so I'm like, okay, hold on. Don't throw the baby out with the bath, bath out with the bathwater. We just need to educate a little better on this and, 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 and show it in a way of this is a healing modality. This is a, this here's how you would specifically use keto for these purposes. That doesn't mean it's the best way or the Mm -hmm. optimal way or the only way, which that is my beef with the, some of the keto community is when we start um, spreading the message of like, it's almost elitism. It's almost like we're smarter than everybody else because we know about keto. And, and this is like, if people get their ego wrapped up Mm -hmm. into it or their identity wrapped up into it. So when they don't do keto, they go through like a freaking identity crisis almost, you know? Yeah. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is not healthy. So I love that we're on like the same team. Like we're trying to say like, there's still benefits to doing Mm -hmm. keto, but our job as health professionals is to educate people on why and when and how, and, and that's an option, but it's not like it makes you a better person Mm -hmm. or a, you know, you're superior doing the superior health approach or something. Cause it's not that way at all, because when we can present it that way, then when they're ready to bring carbohydrates back in, it's something that they're 
their understanding that is, is a part of their journey and that will help them not like they've got to heal their relationship with carbs because they've been taught that they're inflammatory. They're trying to kill them. You know, like that message drives me freaking bananas. Like, yeah. I'm like, are you serious? You're telling people that plants are trying to kill them. Like I'm gonna kill you. Like that makes me so frustrated. So like, um, yeah, like uh, I don't like fear, you know, we don't need to have fear with food. I'm, I am a believer also in, um, the, the effects of our thought processes. Like if you could eat, I think you could eat something healthy. And if you tell yourself it's poison and it's hurting you, you actually can create some damage in your body. There's actually research on that. It's kind of how the placebo effect works. And so I think it's really important that we don't create fear around foods and we don't create good, bad thinking around food. It's not, it's not a bad food. I always, I like to throw a wrench in people's minds. And I'm like, if you were out and the, somebody else told me this, so I, I got this from somebody. I'm sorry. I can't remember who said this. Maybe it was Sean Wells. I'm not sure. But somebody said like, if you were out in the desert, um, dying McDonald's and Coca-Cola would be super good for you. <laughs> <laughs> they would increase your lifespan by quite a bit. And that's like, Ooh, that's so hard for us to like, cause we're like, it's bad. It's bad. It's bad. But like, think about that. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, I, and I share that because like, I really would like us to enter more into an age of understanding, like what happens as a result of this choice, not shame and guilt. Cause that was a bad choice, mm -hmm. right? Because then it, it provides you freedom to choose, you know, and freedom to make a more, um, mindful decision where it's just owning the results of the choices you're making instead of being like, I, that was bad. I shouldn't have had, I know that it's bad to eat canola oil. I can't believe I did that. Like, it's like, dude, just understand what happens as a result, you know, of doing that a lot. Um, instead of getting into this, like, yeah, I, that's my biggest beef I'd say in like the honestly keto primal paleo health optimization communities is, um, good, bad thinking mm -hmm. around food because it causes a lot of shame that's unnecessary. And it puts people into a box where they feel like they almost can't eat anything mm -hmm. without like hurting themselves. And it's like, woof, I think we need to take a big step back and it's okay to educate and know about these things. But we also have to like be a little bit more realistic about it so people can then like enjoy their lives and their their pursuits and health haven't now brought them into a place where they feel freaking paralyzed and they can't even enjoy like they I've had clients who have been at restaurants and they couldn't even enjoy their time because all they they're caught in their head about how much canola oil they were eating. So they it like removed their, so the, the social benefit of having this enriched experience with their friends and family because they're, they're trapped in fear mm -hmm. around canola oil. That's not okay. You know? So like we, we need to start opening these conversations more and really trying to get more into like, what's the big picture? How can we focus more on positive strides and health versus getting into fear about all these things that can hurt us and are bad for us? Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent agree. Again, <laughs> preaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, cool. So I want to chat a little bit about, cause I know we're, I don't want to get take too much of your time, but I want to chat a little bit about, um, kind of your like kind of new event adventure that you're, you're going through right now with bodybuilding prep. And I think yeah. that, you know, I personally haven't been through a bodybuilding competition, but it is something that I may want to do in the future. Um, I kind of want to just like get your kind of take on like what what made you like decide mm -hmm. to do this or like, you know, what what kind of brought this about and how has it been? And, and what are you like, what are you trying to, I guess, get out of this experience? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So, um, for me, like when I first got like fit or whatever, I was basically living like a bodybuilder style lifestyle. Right. And people would ask me all the time. They're like, are you going to compete? Cause I was, you know, at like 10, 11% body fat, you're pretty shredded. And they were like, you can probably just step on a stage right now. And I'm like, when, like, just do it. And the reason I didn't want to back then was honestly, like, I'm a little bit more of like a tomboy. Like I, I, I just like, like the athletic side of it, like standing, walking on a stage in a thong bikini and heels and like crystal jewelry bracelets. And I was just like, that's just like not my personality at all. Like I have no desire to do that. That's not why I'm doing this. Like, I just, I just love it. Like, I just love the challenge. I love the fitness. I love the actual act of training. Like, I love it. It's fun for me. Um, and, um, so that's why I didn't back then. And then as I started coaching more and more, especially being a ketogenic diet specialist, I found I had a lot of previous competitors coming to me for coaching because I think that they wanted to be able to stay lean and shredded year round. And they saw keto as a possible avenue to be able to do that. And so 
I started, as I started coaching a lot of competitors, I got a very poor taste in my mouth for that, for the industry, for bodybuilding, physique competitions, bikini competitions, all of that, because what I was experiencing in my clients was a lot of body dysmorphia. Um, so they like just hated their bodies if they weren't completely lean and shredded. Like I'm looking at these people, I'm like, you're like more fit than I am right now. And I'm, I feel really great about my body and you like hate your body. Like what is going on? So that I was like, well, uh, I feel like all these people got into this because they had low self-esteem and they're trying to earn it through their bodies. And then, so that gave me a poor taste. Um, also several of them had, um, a lot of bad blood work, like a lot of inflammation, um, hypothyroidism, common. Um, uh, so I was just like uh, low HDL was very common. And I was just like, okay, I don't really like the fruits I'm seeing in their, in their bodies either. And then, um, on top of it, I just like, honestly, like kind of found it like a yucky industry, like a lot of like, like over sexualization. And like, I don't know, I just like had a really bad taste in my mouth about it. Um, and, um, actually, um, the guy that I'm dating right now is, is a competitor. And I told him, I was like, I had to like, kind of get over some things with you. Cause like, when I saw that you competed, like that was like a downside for me. Like, I was like, like, I know what that means. He's got like all these unhealthy emotional patterns and blah, blah, blah. I was judging it for sure. <laughs> Um, he doesn't, he actually just really likes goal setting and like doing difficult things and challenging himself. And, you know, I mean, he did, he's quintessential guy. He wanted to be like Arnold growing up and he's just like, I just thought it was cool. Like, I just, I just like the challenge and having like a concrete goal. So it kind of shifted my paradigm. And so, um, I was like, you know what, I'm being kind of a jerk judging something that I've never experienced. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to do it. And I also wanted to be coached also like you, I like finding the best in the world or, you know, whoever I think is the best in the world and learning from them. Cause there's so much, so many insights that come to you as a coach when you mm -hmm. are coached by someone Absolutely. else. Um, so I was referred to, um, the pro physiques in Arizona, um, Damien, the owner of the pro physiques is my coach. And it's been like, you know, it's so awesome is it has been actually what I was judging as something that would be like harmful and dangerous to the body. It's actually been quite healing to my body. And what I mean by that is like purely out of necessity for like being able to vacuum and hold my abs in, you know, I've had four kids, um, and stand in good posture, like just doing that in and of itself, like has alerted me to so many like tight ligaments and overactive muscles and underactive muscles that I've had that have been causing like postural problems in me that I've had to go address and I'm getting worked on, mm -hmm. um, by a mas massage therapist and doing my own work at home. Um, lots of rolling, and doing work with, um, uh, lacrosse balls and getting things loosened up. That's been, it's like, wow. I'm like, my mo mobility is up. My core strength is up. Um, also just learning to step outside of my comfort zone and have somebody coach me in their way. Like with training, uh, it's like been super eye opening. Um, I've had to really dial in nutrition, which has been, super challenging because I've realized I really like to just wing it. Yeah. And so like having to track everything has been like, ugh. so it's yeah. been good for me with my clients. It's provide a lot of insights on that. Um, so it's been like an incredibly positive experience so far. So I'm, I'm really grateful that I, that I've done it. And yeah, I'm eating carbs. My, my audience is finding this very interesting because they're seeing, I'm, I'm sharing my food in my mm -hmm. Instagram I've been stories. Watching, yeah. I've been seeing. That. Yeah. And so people are like, wow, you're eating like a lot of carbs. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? And I'm like, I feel great. You know? So that's, that's been really good. The only thing is like, I don't know if it's just because I'm at a calorie deficit and I'm training really hard, which will cause you to feel like not quite as mm -hmm. point in your brain, in your brain. It could just be that, or it could be the low fats. Cause I'm eating like 44 grams of fat a day, which as you know, coming from the keto world is crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> low when you're used to more. Um, but I have been feeling like I've been feeling good, but just not as on fire with mm -hmm. my brain. I have been using a little bit of ketone esters and MCT oil every once in a while when I just need some brain power. But, um, yeah, overall, like it's been a, a really positive experience and I'm scared as crap to walk on a stage in a freaking bikini and heels. And I feel like I have to like pretend I'm someone else that is, is not me, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it'll be, it's a good growth journey yeah. for me for sure. Yeah. That's exactly like what you, when you first started talking about it, like how you don't want to go on stage and, and heels and stuff. That's like Ugh. literally exactly why I'm just like, I'm not doing this. Cause that's not me <laughs> either. I'm like a tomboy. Like I don't like, that's just, I, I would like yell at my mom for making me wear dresses when I was younger. Like 
that whole thing. Yeah. Like, and they, but... girl, and they put me in the bikini division, which is like the <laughs> ultimate, like, like pretty hair flips yeah. and like, yeah. <laughs> but it'll be like you said, it's like getting out of your comfort zone. I think it's just so mm-hmm. important for anything. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to learn, like you've already learned yep. so much from the experience. And I think that's one thing too, just like going through it yourself. Like for, for me right now, I've been I've gained 12 pounds since July because I put myself through with my coach a building phase, right? Like being in a surplus and just really focusing on building muscle and just optimizing as much as I can. And yeah, it's freaking uncomfortable watching the scale go up like, you know, week after week and like, you know, getting a little bit more fluffy and just being like, okay, like this is part of the process. Like I'm doing this for a reason. I have someone that I can, you know, lean on and, and hold me accountable for things, but it's uncomfortable, right? But I've already learned so much, like over the past, I think it's been like seven or eight months and like performance is going up in the gym, like you're realizing all these things yep. are happening and it's just like, okay, I need to, you know, going through this myself is helping me as a coach to help other people yep. go through it. And it's just yep. been, like you said, it's just been super eye opening, and yeah. So I think it's really important for people to kind of, realize that, you know, one other thing that I've been really focusing on now is like the instant gratification side of things versus Mm -hmm. the long term gratification. And like, okay, the decisions I'm making right now, like, I don't like I'm not thinking about what what's going to happen tomorrow or in a week from now, but like what is happening? Like, where do I want to be six months from now? Right? Like, how do how can I like stop with the instant gratification and really focus on the long term? And I think that's especially with clients like you know, this is, and I'm sure you have like a, a minimum commitment for when they sign up for you. Like I have a three month minimum commitment. I think that's still pretty, like very small amount of time to see a good amount of change. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that's one thing, like you have to commit to the long term. You have to continue to like remind yourself, okay, I don't care what's happening. Like where I'm at, where I'm at two weeks from now, like where am I at six months from now or three months from now, whatever. Um, Cause that's what matters. Right. But it's so hard. Like you yep. live in the world of instant gratification is so hard. Um, so yeah. <laughs> and I think for women, especially like that. Yeah. For women, that instant gratification is skinny, 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 skinny. And it's like, you know what, if you can let that go and you can actually focus on building some muscle, that whole skinny thing you want to do is going to be easier long term, but exactly. you have to be willing to do like what Rachel's doing. You have to be willing to get outside of your current paradigm and like go towards growth. And it's, it's a, it's a, don't you find it's a much more mature outlook. It's mm-hmm. a much more balanced, um, educated kind of outlook when you're thinking long-term versus just like this manic right now, I need it to be the way I want it to be. It's, it's short-sighted yeah. is how it feels. So yeah, yeah, I love your perspective on that. Yeah, for sure. And then also just speaking about like building muscle, maybe we can chat. Do you have a, do you have a few minutes? I do. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe we can chat a little bit about just like, you know, we women, right? We we all want this. We've talked about I feel like this has gone like the last few years, it's kind of, you know, people are starting to understand it more, but like the tone, yeah. the look, right? Like yeah. I want to be toned. Okay. So what does that mean? Like, can we chat a little bit about why like you have to spend time actually building muscle? Because the tone look doesn't come from just losing the body fat. The tone looks toned look comes from building muscle and spending time there and then yeah losing a little bit but a little bit of body fat and that's where the muscle comes out right and that's where you can see that yeah so I know you obviously yeah. have experience with this maybe we can just chat a little about chat a little bit about like why it's so important to spend time like actually fueling your body appropriately to build muscle because like you said it's gonna long term be the best route so maybe we can just chat about that a little yeah bit. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So if you can see me on YouTube, if you're watching us on YouTube, like if you can see my arm, like my arm looks pretty toned, maybe this is too muscular for some women. I don't know, but I can tell you for this level of tone, I go freaking bananas. Like my whole life is focused around this level of tone. Okay. Like I lift every day. I, I don't have seasons of, I just went off the rails and ate pizza and ice cream for three months. I haven't had that in like six years. Right. So this is like full on effort. And I also feel like I gain muscle pretty easily. Um, there's like, there's like deep sleep component to that. I kind of wonder, I get a lot of deep sleep, which is when your muscles recover. I kind of wonder if maybe that's part of it, but anyway, I'm just sharing, like, if you want, like, this is me at rest, right. But at the gym, do I look kind of like muscle woman? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because when you're lifting, like you're, you're sending blood flow to that area, it's going to fill up with blood and it's going to look pretty muscular. And that's what I learned right away. Even when I was less muscular looking than this. And 
gosh, I would get like so many compliments on my arms from women. I was like, you should see me in the gym. Like I look scary in the gym. Like I, like there is like so much muscle. Um, but when you're, you know, at rest and your muscles are just at rest, if you want your arms to look like that at rest, you're going to have to build quite a bit of muscle to achieve that look. A lot of even these guys that you see on Instagram that look like these like muscle men, if you just see them in a t-shirt at work, you can barely even <laughs> tell that they are fit. You can barely tell. So like, you know, don't confuse like what you're seeing on Instagram when somebody's like all flexed out and they've all the blood flow and everything is in their muscles versus regular. If you want to look toned at rest, you're going to need a lot of muscle to look like that. The other aspect of it is, yeah, you're going to, you are going to have to be kind of lean. Like if I wasn't as lean as I am right now, it would look like I have, you wouldn't know what my muscle mass would be because it would be under body fat. So I'm just being real with people. It's like, yeah, there's a, it's a combo. You have to have muscle and you have to be lean enough for it to pop out. <laughs> um, but what's cool about building muscle is in my opinion, it makes it so much easier to be lean because of what happens when, okay. So for example, um, this morning I crushed it high intensity interval training. Like I am working in a glycolytic capacity, like crazy. So what I mean by that is all the carbs that I ate yesterday are stored up in my muscles and my liver. And then I go in and I go super intense and, you know, maybe let's, let's use lifting as an example, since we're talking about muscles, like, so let's, and I go in and I crush a lifting workout. So my body is going to release some of that stored carbohydrate into my bloodstream to fuel the performance. What does that mean though? That means when I come back home today and I eat carbs again, there's space for it. Mm. I, I used some of it. So I created space for those carbs to go into my liver and glyc and muscles again and be stored for the next time. Right. And so this is how you can eat carbs and not get fat. <laughs> like a really simple level. You have this intermediary storage tank. You have this middleman and it's your muscles and your liver with carbs. So yeah, if you're not active at all and you're not, you know, like it's going to take you a long time to use that. Like mm. you're just sitting around in your house and just being alive. Like you're not going to dump that much, but if you go into the gym and you're doing stuff to build muscles, then when you come home and you eat again, you eat some protein and carbs, for example, one, you have space and two, like you want those carbs to help shuttle those proteins into your muscles to help recover. So now like your carbs and your food in general, they're working for you. They're not going to body fat. They're going to muscle building. So it makes being leaner easier because you actually have a requirement in your body for that food to do what you want it to do. But if you never lift, I mean, you're just not gonna be able to eat very much because mm -hmm. it's, it's like, get ready to be hungry. <laughs> and then you're not gonna, you might, you might be able to be hungry enough to lose weight, but then like your shape isn't going to look that good. You're just going to look skinny fat. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's the ultimate hack, you know, and on top of it, there's like a million longevity benefits, you BDNF in your brain and like, um, do the dopamine rush that you get that you helps you with performance in the rest of your life, the anti-depression benefits, the way it strengthens your, you know, it's not as much pressure on your ligaments and tendons. Like it's like everything good happens yeah. <laughs> in your body. Like you're, you're, you will look better. You will feel better. You will live longer. Your mood will be better. You'll literally be, literally be smarter and less depressed. I mean, it's like, the list just goes on and on. So I like to share that with women. Cause like, I'm like, please don't be afraid of building muscle. Like try as hard as you freaking can. Cause it's actually really hard. We don't have that much testosterone. So like, it's actually not, it's not easy. Like try as hard as you freaking can and you will build like a teeny <laughs> tiny bit, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's my message on that. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And like, you're not just going to like blow up. Like, and I think this is something <laughs> that people are starting to realize too. Like it takes, like I said, it takes a lot of work to actually put on muscle and it takes time and patience. And obviously if you're someone who's new, like if you're a newbie, right, you're going to yeah. make those gains quick. Like you mentioned when you first started lifting, like you changed your body composition in a year and a half, right? And you probably put on a good amount of muscle during that time. And the thing to realize too, is that you can put like putting on muscle is a very, very like patient process. And like, you have to, you know, work hard and continue progressing with that. If you want to continue to put on muscle, but maintaining yep. muscle that you've built is actually not as yeah. hard. Like you can do, I mean, studies show like you could do half the amount of work and still maintain the muscle that you yep. have. 
So yep. I think that's another thing too. Like just put in the work and like spend a few years like building muscle. It's not yeah. like you have to do it for the rest of your life. Like you, yeah, you have to you know keep up with it. But you know if you're training four days a week, you could potentially train two days a week and still yep. maintain that. So yeah, and then it's the an amazing eat- investment. Mm-hmm, exactly. And then the eating more part, right? Like that's something with women like we always want to see the scale go down right we always want to see yeah. that happen but when you do that like if you become like a smaller version of yourself this is how our bodies work like it you are not going to be able to eat as much calories right if you are a smaller version of yourself like the our main kind of you know the, <laughs> exactly the amount of calories we can consume is really based off of how heavy we are like that's a exactly. big component so if you can uh gain weight and for a lot of that weight to be through muscle like down the line, you're going to be able to eat a little bit more. And like you said, you're going to be like, your muscles are going to soak up those carbs. Like it's going to be beneficial for you. So yeah. And you're going to look smaller because the muscle is more um, dense and heavy than fat. Yeah. People always tell me, cause I'm like, I'm generally between somewhere between 145 and 150 pounds. And people see me on Instagram and I look all lean and stuff. And they're like, you're 150 pounds. I'm like, yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like it, because it's that optical illusion. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. So yeah, yeah. it's, it, to me, it's this, it's like the secret. I don't, I don't, I, I would rather way rather, I mean, you get so many benefits and you can eat food instead of like, otherwise, like if you want to be thin, I feel like your option is like barely eat food. And then we get into micronutrient deficiencies and all mm-hmm. that. And it's like, then you don't have the strength for your, your bones and ligaments and tendons. And it's just, yeah, it's to me, it's like, you got to do it, go do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, for me too, it's been this shift. Like, I don't want to see the scale go down anymore. Like, obviously the scale's going to awesome. have to drop. Like, you know, if I'm going to like cut a little bit of the body fat that I've put on with the muscle yeah. that I put on over the last eight months, but like, I don't ever want to see the scale go down to what it was like for my photo shoot. Like yeah. I'm hoping that I never see that number again. Like I want it to keep going up. Yeah. Um, and I think that when you make that mental shift and you un- mental shift and you understand that it's like, yeah, just changes Beautiful. so many things. Yeah, it's very empowering. I love that. Yeah, for sure. And then also just to kind of wrap up, like we've been talking a lot about, you know, having the best of both worlds and like being, you know, metabolically flexible, being able to use carbs and fats for fuel. And I think like this is something that shifted, like when I kind of thought about it this way, it completely shifted everything, like kind of looking at at it as a spectrum, right? Like the more, you know, overweight and obese and less active and sedentary you are, you're going to be more towards this spectrum where, you know, keto is probably going to be really, really beneficial for you. Right. But like you said, like if you're starting there, then start there. But then as you lose the weight, as you lose 40, 50 pounds, as you start exercising and feel better about yourself and go go to the gym and lift weights and build muscle, you're going to kind of inch towards this other side of the spectrum, which is leaner and more active. And when you're towards that side, like carbs are going to be your friend. Right. So, yep. I think that's like a Love huge, it. yeah, <laughs> obviously we're on the same page here, but mm-hmm. just kind of shifting that focus. Right. And I've seen it with so many of my clients too. Like you said, they lose 50 pounds with keto and yep. it, it works. So I, I don't want to like introduce carbs. Cause then what if that doesn't work anymore? But mm-hmm. really, I mean, from what my experience, like it's going to work better for you. You're going to, you know, prosper yeah. with that. Just remember you're in a different body. Now you're in a different exactly. body, <laughs> <laughs> different bodies have different needs. So exactly. yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. I love the way you put that. Awesome. Well, this was a really fun conversation. Um, yeah. really glad we, we got to do it. Um, do you want to just share with our listeners and our viewers, you know, where they can find you on your website, social media sure. and any like programs or anything you have available? Yep, sure. Um, so coach Tara Garrison is my Instagram handle and it's T A R A. Um, that's where I share like everything. Please watch my stories. Cause I try my best to share. I'm always trying to show like what it actually looks like. So if I'm making food or doing where I share a lot of my stories, um, that's where most of the action is. And then um, my website is Tara Garrison.com. Everything's linked in my Instagram bio. So that's kind of the hub, my website, you know, I have a YouTube channel and yes, I do have like keto in and out program that I sh- teach people how to go through keto and match their workouts and bring carbs back in and match your workouts. It's on my website. And then I do coaching. My coaching is mindset, biohacking and training and nutrition. But I know that you do the same thing. So if you're listening to Rachel, go to Rachel. But if you want some ideas from me on, you know, on Instagram and stuff like that, please come follow me there. I would love to, to hear from you guys, especially if you found me through Rachel. So th- thank you, Rachel. I, I so appreciate and admire your work. You're incredible. I love the way you put things. I love how you keep things real. And I know we're on the same mission. So I appreciate you like just coming together, letting me come on today and like share that same passion with your audience today. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, likewise, and I will definitely link everything you mentioned, um, in the show notes. And 
maybe have you, cause I did, I had a few um, other questions about like mindset work and all of that. So maybe I can have mm. you on for a part two and we can dive I into would love all that. that. Cause that is definitely like not, I haven't, you know, gone into that wheelhouse a lot. So I definitely mm. want to learn more about that. So. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to. It's the, I would say it's the bread and butter of what I do now. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to talk about it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, thank right. you so much for taking the time. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.